Now a word or two about tonight's activity. Tonight marks the latest installment of our first 100 days programming, an eight part series designed to help us navigate this, how shall I put it, unprecedented political era. Conversations over the next few weeks will delve into trade, into inequality, power, and other timely themes. All will feature Graduate Center scholars and other national figures. I do hope that you can attend. Now within this uh, set of programming on the first 100 days is a miniseries called Activists of the Past, What Have We Learned? The concept was inspired by David Nassau, who's the Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. Professor of History here at the Graduate Center. As an institution that values and transmits research and those increasingly old-fashioned things that we call facts, <laughs> we wanted to examine some facts. We wanted to examine modern political activism through the lens of history, and I say that as someone who um, is fortunate to count himself as a member of our history program. Who were some of the leaders of past movements and what can their challenges and their successes teach us today? Last month, we were fortunate to welcome Charles Blow in conversation with legendary author and AIDS activist Larry Kramer. Tonight, as you know, we turn to the civil rights movement. It is, of course, a timely issue. Earlier this month, over 150 major American civil rights groups called on the president to more forcefully respond to an increase in hate-related incidents across the country. Now, our moderator this evening, the Emmy award-winning journalist Carol Jenkins has framed the modern movement as activists and young people increasingly disconnected from the old ways of doing things. She went on to say, an ever-widening chasm between haves and have-nots in education, policing, prison reform, wages, health, religion, and the rights of girls and women, that proves that we need to get to work. Tonight, Carol will talk with legendary civil rights leaders whose grassroots activism has shaped modern America. And on behalf of all of us at the Graduate Center, we thank you for taking part. Some introductions. Ruby Nell Sales, a key figure in the Freedom Summer voter registration drive in 1964, is one of 50 activists from the civil rights movement featured in the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. A public theologian, historian, social critic, and educator, she describes her work as, quote, a calling. She is the founder and director of the Spirit House Project and has won wide acclaim for her tireless efforts to promote racial justice and equality. The Reverend Herbert Daughtry is known for his civil rights activism spanning more than five decades. He's been a leader in the fight for school integration, equal access to jobs and economic opportunity, and served as a special assistant to the Reverend Jesse Jackson. An outspoken critic of police violence, he's traveled the world to advocate for human rights. Since 1959, he's been the national presiding minister of the House of the Lord Churches. Our own Clarence Taylor is a professor of history whose research interests encompass the modern civil rights and black power movements, African American religion, and the modern history of New York City. He's written extensively about civil rights, particularly the history and legacy of segregation in New York City schools. His books include Reds at the Blackboard, Communism, Civil Rights, and the New York City Teachers Union. And leading the discussion, as I mentioned, <clears throat> is writer, producer, community leader, and media consultant, Carol Jenkins. Just this month, she was included in USA Today's list of women of color you should know. Yeah. 
She's perhaps best known for her almost 25 year career as a reporter and anchor for WNBC, where she covered presidential politics, mayoral election, and Nelson Mandela's release from prison, among many other milestones. Today, she hosts Black America on CUNY TV, a weekly conversation with prominent activists, scholars, and leaders. Please do join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers and enjoy the evening. Of course, it's going to be the major test of a former broadcaster to make sure that the microphone is actually on, you know. One does get, get rusty. It is uh, my pleasure uh, to be here uh, today. So grateful that you all are here to, to witness the, uh, the, the wonderful words and actions. I mean, a lot of us have wonderful words and some fewer of us have wonderful actions and these are people uh, who can be counted in that, uh, in that category. Uh, I just want to say briefly as, a, as an introduction, uh, even though I'm a New Yorker, I grew up here, uh, I was born in Lowndes County, Alabama, which will become interesting when we talk with Ruby, uh, on a farm in Lowndes County, Alabama in the 1940s, if you can picture that scene. Uh, I indeed was barefoot <laughs> and one of a huge uh, family. Uh, uh, my, my immediate family moved to... Um, to New York City when I was about three or four, so I really cannot claim, even though my entire multitudinous family still lives in Birmingham and in Montgomery and in Lowndes County, usually within uh, two or three houses from their mothers, you know, that's the way the Southern families operate. Um, uh, and I, I get to go down there. Well, so I was brushed, though, by uh, the civil rights history because that farm where I was born was actually stop three on the march from Selma to Montgomery, the uh, Gardner family uh, farm. Uh, and so uh, we were able to, you know, claim that we made a uh, contribution. We gave them wet, soggy grass to sleep on uh, that night. Uh, and then the other brush with the history is that uh, my uh, mother's sister happened to marry A.G. Gaston, who uh, owned uh, many businesses uh, towards the end of it, including the A.G. Gaston Motel, which was the headquarters for Martin Luther King uh, when he was desegregating Birmingham in 1963. Um, and as you may know, one of President Obama's last acts was to proclaim uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights District, including my uncle's motel, which will be restored, the 16th Street Baptist Church, which is the scene of the murder of four young girls, uh, the park there, and the Birmingham uh, Civil Rights Institute into uh, Bur the Birmingham Civil Rights Monument. It's now, it's so, if you can imagine, it used to be you know, Birmingham is a small town, if you've ever been there. But now it's run by uh, park tr uh, troopers, you know. You see them walking around, the rangers in their uniforms, giving tours and things. So, so it is a major uh, step, I think, in preserving the history of the civil rights uh, actions that took place in Birmingham, Alabama, and for the generations to come. Uh, I w want to turn now to Clarence Taylor. I've been reading his books forever. And in fact, when we just met, but when we were talking on the phone, I thought I was talking to the son of the man who wrote all of those books. Uh, and I thought, oh no, that's you. You did all of that. So Clarence, uh, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And he's going to give us an overview, a historic overview, uh, and then we will launch into the, uh, the discussion with our activists. Clarence. Well, let me just say uh, that it's really an honor to be uh, on stage with uh, legendary uh, Carol Jenkins and also Reverend Herbert Daughtry uh, and uh, Reverend uh, Ruby Sales. Now, uh, throughout American history, people denied their constitutional rights and deprived of the rights and opportunities provided to others have taken part in social protest movements. Those involved in social protest movements have adopted strategies to pressure those in power 
to end the discriminatory and repressive measures denying them political and economic justice. The civil rights movement was the most important social protest movement of the 20th century. The movement helped produce some of the most noted national leaders of the 20th century, such as the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, the United States Congressman John Lewis, uh, and of course, social activist uh, uh, Ruby Sales. Moreover, countless numbers of people, people we never know the names of, participated in this movement for social justice to abolish legal segregation. The Civil Rights Movement was the most influential social protest movement of the 20th century because social protest movements modeled themselves after the Civil Rights Movement, including the Chicano Movement, uh, the Women's Liberation Movement, uh, the Gay and Lesbian Movement. And one of the most central accomplishments of the Civil Rights Movement was the pivotal role it played in the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Two pieces of legislation that help eliminate the American apartheid system, you know, legal segregation. And we should recognize that the movement was not limited to the South. A vibrant, vibrant civil rights campaigns took place throughout the, uh, this country, including this city. We are honored today with the presence of Reverend Herbert Daughtry, one of the pivotal leaders of the New York City struggle. Uh, we celebrate the movement through commemorations, commercial films such as Selma, documentaries including the award-winning Eyes on the Prize and Stanley Nelson's Freedom Riders, and loads of monographs and textbooks. But we need to do more than just celebrate the heroic efforts of past generations. We need to examine the past in order to understand the present and to see if there are lessons for us today in this fight for social and racial justice. Now, there are a number of people who reject the idea that the civil rights movement is useful today. Many writers, scholars, and even former civil rights activists contend that the civil rights movement is over and we are now in a, quote, post-civil rights era. Proponents of the post-civil rights era contend that the civil rights movement was successful in its goal of eliminating legal discrimination. They also agree that black Americans and people of color are now facing new sets of problems that have nothing to do with legal discrimination. Therefore, civil rights move, the civil rights movement, like the one uh, generation earlier, cannot address the, uh, the problem that blacks, Latinos, and other people are facing in this country. Advocates of the post-civil rights uh, idea fail to see that the struggle for civil rights has always been a broader political project. Many involved in that civil rights movement cons consistently spoke about more than just the eradication of legal discrimination. The fight for economic justice was key to this movement. The August 1963 March on Washington, its title was the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. A. Philip Randolph, one of its key organizers linked the black struggle to class and economic justice. He had not only helped to organize and win recognition of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters during the 1920s and 1930s, he also spearheaded the 1941 March on Washington movement that forced President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to issue Executive Order 8802, creating a Fair Employment Practices Committee to monitor discrimination in employment and federal jobs. The organizers of that 1963 march wrote that American faces a crisis, millions of Negroes are denied freedom, millions of citizens, black and white, are unemployed, and they demanded meaningful civil rights laws, massive federal works programs, and full 
and fair employment. Martin Luther King Jr. not only contended that the goal of the civil rights movement was to win the right to vote, gain equal access to public accommodation and end school uh, segregation, but to win economic security for millions who were in poverty. As early as 1958, a year after the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was organized, King called for economic justice for black and white workers. Called economic insecurity strangles the physical and cultural growth of its victims, King declared. We are living in interesting times in America. While we see the political gains of the extreme right, the growing inequality of wealth, the uh, uh, separation, excuse me, the suppression of voting rights, an alarming growth of nativist and racist sentiment throughout this country and mass incarceration of black and brown people or what Michelle Alexander called the new Jim Crow. We are also seeing the decline of organized labor, some conventional civil rights organizations and black ministers and churches committed to the social gospel, many of them or committed to prosperity gospel. But it is not all gloom and doom. We are also witnessing the resurgence of left-leaning and progressive social protests, including the fight for 15, which has united workers across the country and fast food and other low-paying uh, industries, the 350 movement, that is challenging climate change. Uh, of course, Black Lives Matter that's confronting police brutality, sexism, LGBT, uh, L, sorry, my sight is bad here, LGBTQ discrimination and institutional racism. It is what one commentator labeled the resurgence of the civil rights movement. As today's civil rights activists attempt to address the current social ills, what can they learn from previous generations of civil rights leaders? Not only what that generation accomplished, but also its failures, also its weaknesses. It is only through deep interrogation of the earlier struggles and not romanticizing the past can we uh, can the civil rights movement be meaningful and useful for today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Ruby. And Clarence, that was a very good uh, sweep of... of uh, of, a of activities that have taken place. Uh, I noticed you didn't go back, uh, you know, to 1767, <laughs> but that's okay. We only have an hour tonight, you know, so. <laughs> but but I, wa I want to talk with Ruby. Today was the first day that we've met, but I don't know whether you read her on Facebook or her blog. From my front porch, her musings on things. And of course, today, she promised to make a ruckus, right? You know, that was the thing. You were fired up, as you often are. I often can't start my day until I get my, you know, instructions. What are we going to do? So what, what is it exactly that got you into this ruckus movement today? You know, it's, uh, you, you were just fed up, right? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you and the CUNY administration and faculty for envisioning this program and for inviting me to be a part of a timely conversation as we try to consider with hindsight, insight, and foresight, where do we stand as a nation? Um, well, I'm fired up about a lot of things, as you know. <laughs> but I was fired up this morning listening to the hearings with the Intelligence Committee where they were manipulating the conversation and wasting our time 
tw using Donald Trump's tweets as the talking points for the Republicans, rather than searching for the real truth. And so I guess I get, and using language of liberal democracy to hide very insidious and anti-democratic -demo sentiments. So that keeps me fired up. And in addition to that, looking at the members of the committee on the Republican side, I'm really struck at the presence of white supremacists in this government. Well, that's enough to get you started, right? <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about, because we have Lowndes County, we have Lowndes County, uh, Alabama yes. in our joint history, yes. because that's where your activism started. Yes. And a Tuskegee student, and yes. you were coax, coached out of, coaxed out of classes yes. to go do Lowndes activism. Lowndes County, yes. Tell us I a little was bit about at that. Tuskegee in the early 1960s, and Tuskegee had been a forerunner in the Southern Freedom Movement commonly known as the Civil Rights Movement, because Dr. Gamillion had gone before the Supreme Court in the 1950s to question gerrymandering in Tuskegee, and he had actually won the case, and you might, people might want to look up that case, Gamillion versus, versus the state of Alabama. At any rate, Tuskegee was a place to be, and a group of SNCC, Overall, overall, wearing students, young folk came to Tuskegee, and I was already on fire because I had discovered James Baldwin. Uh -huh. And I was running around saying, nobody knows my name. And suddenly Stokely Carmichael came to our English class, and he gave me the words to say my name. And he invited some students to go down into Lowndes County, which was called Bloody Lowndes, which when, you, we, when I first went down into Lowndes County, Stokely took me to a gully where you could see the bleached bones of black people over the years who had been murdered and lynched in Lowndes County. But I decided I would go to Lowndes County and I would stay in Lowndes County despite the first episode that happened we went to, to, the, to register people to vote the next day after I was there, and the sheriff pulled a gun to Stokely Carmichael's head, who was Stokely Carmichael then, and not Kwame Ture, and said, nigger, tonight you'll be in hell. And Stokely said, tonight hell will be integrated. <laughs> and, I was, and I was totally amazed <laughs> that somebody would stand up to a gun I was just fascinated and intrigued. And some part of that responded to my rebellious nature and really a profound search for trying to define myself as a Southern African American youth in a very rigidly defined society where, as Du Bois pointed out, the color line held. And so I think it was just a mutual connection between me and the movement. Well, that's quite a start, Ruby. Not all of us can uh, claim that kind of uh, impetus to our, to our activism. But now, uh, also very early on there, Jonathan Daniels, who was a white uh, protester as well, who came down to work with you all, saved your life. Yes. And in doing so, lost his. Yes. Well, quickly, let me just tell the story. We had... First. Adverse. And they would work all year. And when they went to the country store, to the man who also owned the plantation, they never reaped any financial benefits. They were always in the hole. So the young people, black youth, were fired up. They were very upset. And so they came to SNCC. I was a member of SNCC and asked us would we go and demonstrate with them. And my first response, I was horrified. I thought, no, no, I'm not gonna go down there. <laughs> but then they, we realized that we had to do it because we, we could not say to young people, stand up for your rights. And then when they did that, we, told, we couldn't tell them, no, you shouldn't do that. 
And so Jonathan Daniels had come into the county against the wishes of SNCC young people like myself, but Stokely Carmichael challenged us on that. We didn't want him in there because he was white. And Stokely said, the movement is an open space. It's like a black Baptist church. Whosoever will, let them come. And so we agreed that Jonathan could, could come into the county. We were arrested that day. When we went to Fort Deposit to demonstrate, vigilantes, white vigilantes were there with baseball bats, garbage pails, all kinds of weapons threatening to kill us. And the sheriff came and put us on the garbage truck. I had never been so happy to be on a garbage truck in my whole life, to just to get away from there. And we were in jail. And let's understand, let's not romanticize jails. It is true that black people turned sites that were intended to be sites of terror into sites of honor. But the jails were still scary places to be where for women, the, the white jailers threatened to have us raped. It was very frightening. And we were there for five days when they finally told us that we could go and we wanted to know why could we go because no one had posted our bell, no one had told us we could leave. But we, they made us leave and threatened, threatened our lives if we didn't get off the property of the jail. And so we went to that little store it was one of those hot summer August days where the heat palpitated from the cement. And we were thirsty, we were tired, and we were hungry. And we went to the corner store to get a soda. And Tom Coleman, who assassinated Jonathan Daniels, met us at the door. And within a blink of an eye, he said, nigger, B, I will blow your brains out. And before I could process the meaning of that threat, Jonathan Daniels pulled me backwards and I fell. And he was blown up in the sky. He was blown up with the shotgun blast. And we were also with a priest called Father Morris Rowe, who was holding the hands of another black, young black woman named Joyce Bailey and he was running with her, and they were running. And Tom Coleman took aim and shot, um, and shot Father Marshall in the back, and he fell, and he let go of Joyce's hands, and he lay in that hot summer on that pavement, screaming and yelling for water. Joyce called my name behind the car, and I crawled on my knees to where she was, and we ran across the street hysterical. And by the time Stokely Carmichael and other freedom workers like Silas Norman got back downtown, they had cleaned up the street free of any blood, had thrown Father Morris Rose's body as we later discovered, as he told us later, on top of Jonathan Daniels' dead body. Father Morris Rose lay in the hallway of a Montgomery hospital for hours where no doctor would touch him until a white general came and decided he would do surgery, which saved his life. Some story, quite, quite a story. Thank you so much, Ruby, for sharing, sharing that uh, with us. It's, um, I mean, the way you tell it, it's as if we were there. Thank you. Uh, the Reverend Herbert Daughtry, uh, when we saw each other tonight, uh, I said I spent much of my television career, news career, chasing him uh, from one demonstration to the next. And we do want to let you know that he has to leave a bit early tonight. I don't want you to think that he's walking out on us, you know. Uh, he has a funeral uh, service to conduct uh, for one of his uh, parishioners. But Reverend Daughtry, I, I was saying to you earlier that that your early life is pure testament to the fact that people can overcome many, many things because you've had 50 years of service, of activism, of saving lives and changing things. But you started out, 
you know, in, in a very different way. Can you tell us about that? I think your mic should be on, hopefully. Yeah. I think we hear you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Let me say, I remember uh, words from W.E.B. Du Bois, a prodigious scholar who said upon meeting Alexander Cromel, a great uh, theologian of another time, when I met uh, in the room a moment ago that I saw Ruby and uh, Taylor and Carol, I instinctively bowed. I wish we could have just continued hearing. Stokely used to, Kwame used to talk all the time. He would always, whenever we were friends for a long time. And uh, when you talked about Lyons County, he used to talk often. And I don't know that he ever got over uh, Jonathan's death. It shook him. Yeah, never. And it was in Lyons County, obviously, and contrary to the popular notion that the Black Panther Party started. And uh, they came in from Oakland uh, to investigate what you all had done very successfully, by the way. But uh, uh, I could sit here and listen. But I reckon I have some responsibility to say something, to, <laughs> you know, to try to make some sense. Anything. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, um, I came from Georgia, the segregated streets of Georgia. I was born in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, my dad, uh, I'm the fourth generation of ministers in our family. I have two daughters that are the fifth generation. I have a grandson that is going to be the sixth generation. <laughs> and I uh, was born in Savannah, Georgia, and, and Augusta, Georgia. And very early on, uh, I don't know why, even before I must have been six, seven years old, we lived on a dividing line. I could stand in the middle of the street, which I did, and look southward, which was the white part of town. Manicured lawns, gleaming white houses, paved streets. And I turned and looked northward, which was the black part of the street, and dilapidated houses, garbage strewn streets. Always there seemed to have been gullies, you know, puddles of water in the street. And I wondered why. And then when we moved to Augusta, Georgia, I must have been about nine, eight, nine, and I worked in a grocery store. And uh, I was try to play Robin Hood, but they didn't honor me <laughs> the way they did Robin Hood in you the book. You tried to be you know? Rob, Robin yeah. Hood, a little black boy uh, yeah, Robin yeah. Hood, right? Uh, right? I just knew that there was something wrong with the system. You know, we, our people, black people, people of African ancestry, uh, again, were impoverished, trying to make it. And I just knew there was something wrong with this system. So I would try to even the bags of whatever was being sold, and I would uh, add a little something to their bags. Uh, and eventually I was caught. I was caught by uh, a young person who worked for the store, which taught me a, a lesson I, I shall never forget, that he worked for the store, and I knew he was watching me, and I knew I would eventually be fired, but I tried to steal everything I could get my hands on for the bags, for the for, for our people and right. trying to balance the books. The beginning of your activism, it, right? It's it's been early on, yes. So when we moved to uh, Georgia, uh, uh, Brooklyn, I was about 11 years old, 12, and uh, encountered a whole different world. I was completely disoriented. And not only that, uh, where in, in the South, I was the bishop's boy, but in the North, nobody cared who boy I was. I know I was... You know, I couldn't talk right. I uh, made fun of my accent. Are you Obama? You know, where you from? You're Obama. What's your name? My name is Hubbard. Who you mean? Herbert, don't you? you uh, and so they laughed at my clothing. And so it meant you, you, you fight back. You either commit suicide or you fight back. And I wasn't about to, to uh, take my own life. And so we started fighting back. And you know, we got good at fighting back. And, and not only that, but the badder you were, the more popular you became. And so uh, uh, my first arrest, 16 years old, we didn't do anything standing in the door of a store, really, never touched, never broke anything, touched anything. And next thing we knew, the police was 
descending on us as though we were public enemy number one. I was hauled off to jail. I spent two weeks in old Raymond Street Jail. My dad had to come and get me out. But, uh, you know, when I went to jail, I knew everybody in jail. And so I was a kind of celebrity. Wait, wait a minute. You knew everybody in jail? Practically. I, I mean, the guys that I'd hung with. And, right. You know, oh, okay. Battled, right. Your guys were like that. already there. So right? already there. And, and so I became a celebrity, you know, when I got to jail. <laughs> hey, man, Doc's in jail. Yeah. And then when I came home, I really, I mean, they read, laid out the red carpet for me. Man, you've been to jail. Yeah, I've been to jail. Ain't nothing, man. I so the law and order people who think that they're doing something to help society by toughening the young people, sending them away, they're only creating more problems, they're exacerbating the problem. So from there, I went from one to the other. And then in 1953, you know, I was getting ready to do some long time for armed robbery, uh, assault with a weapon, for um, uh, weapon possession and for the state and then for the governmental money laundering. And so I had a whole lot of stuff. And I looked at my life You're at the time, always, I was 23. Uh, I was you were 23, 23 then? Or? I was uh, 23, that was in February 1923. I'm, I was born 1931, so I was 22 years old. And I looked at my life, my mother came to see me and I, it just blew my mind. We had lived by a code, you know, from, uh, what's his name, book, live fast, die young, have a good looking corpse. So nobody expected to live long. So being in jail and I couldn't get out, there was no bailing me out because I had some of the boy bail me out at one part, they picked me up from another. So I got on my knees and I put an overcoat and I pulled the overcoat over my head and I looked at my life and I said, Lord Jesus, I don't even know if you're up there. And I don't even know if I'm not trying to manipulate you now. I've been cheating and stealing so long. But if you're there, I just want you to take my life and use me any way you want to use me. I'm completely yours. That was February 1953. I went to jail, did some time, went back to school, and uh, wrote on the wall. And as I was getting ready to come out of Lewisburg, Wrote, on, wrote the document that I call the Lewisburg document that I was called to have an impact on the world. And that's on my jail cell, that's on my wall in my office. And so the rest is history. You know, my involvement, immediately involvement. Um, we came along, by the way, yeah. after the so-called civil rights movement. Right. I sort of came with the black liberation movement, black power, you know, uh, black liberation movement, African, we, we, my, that part of the struggle, um, uh, Afrocentric, Pan-Africanist, uh, uh, nationalist, right. I chaired the National Black United Front. And I have to say, uh, you are one of the persons that uh, we absolutely trusted. And that's saying an awful lot. I was saying a moment ago, I won a character defamation lawsuit against one of the television station because of the way they sought to disparage and destroy me. So uh, I'm, I'm married, I've been married 54 years. I uh, woo, woo. still married. <laughs> I, and I you? My, my children, my, my, yeah. my, my, let me got to tell you this, my number, my, I'd have to see, I have to be careful how I say this. My, the firstborn daughter, you know, made history. She was the CEO of the 2008 Democratic Convention, which propelled Obama into office. Mrs. Clinton, Hillary came back and said, girl, I want you to do it again. Can you do it again? She was the CEO of the 2016. And she did a great job. And That's Leah Daughtry. Job. Did and, a wonderful, wonderful and, job. And uh, my second daughter, who has been there with me. Uh, my third daughter is a principal, who is also a minister. And finally, my son, uh, who is, huh? Who is Peg Pot? Leah. Yeah, Leah, the one. And, and Don. Don is also a minister. And finally, my son is, is uh, our son is, you know, your sisters have a little something to do with it. You know, brothers have to worry. So. And praise and, <laughs> but anyway, uh, he's, he's the attorney. Then he decided that, hey, dad, I'm just trying to, uh, all I'm doing is plea bargaining. I got to do something to, to preventive. So he got back into education. His school was one of the most improved in Brooklyn. Then they hired him in 
a certain city, large city in Newark, where he became so, assistant superintendent yeah, so it's of a, schools. And yeah, it's a, et cetera, success, et it's a success story. You kept your promise, you know, that you made on your knees. Only by and the grace of God. Because of that, you spent 50 years in uh, New York City and elsewhere around the world uh, seeking justice for... I was uh, reading... We, we tend to think that some of the uh, problems that people have had, uh, black people have had with the police department started... Uh, last year or the year before, and in fact, uh, it was what the 19, uh, 1975 or six that this young boy was shot point blank by a police officer in New York City. Yeah, Randy and, Evans, November 1976. 1976, and that was your one of your first right. demanding of accounting for his death. Shot him in the head. Uh, year later, use your mic so they can. Hear. Year later, the jury pretty much acquitted him. Said he had psychomotor epileptic seizure. I said I'll never forget it. If I live to be a thousand, and the jury pretty much acquitted him. We call for Black Christmas '77. Let's shut down New York. Okay, now Ruby, you wanted to? Yes, I, I wanted to just contextualize state-sanctioned murder of African American people by police. Angela Davis reminds us that that is a long, unbroken thread in American history that extends all the way back to enslavement with slave patrols, as well as uh, different periods in American history. It is important that we understand that this is not a new phenomenon, that, part, that when you look at the eyes on the prize and you see the police executing acts of torture, and to put cattle prods on people, to, to unleash horses and cattle cow, and, and dogs on them, that is torture. And so this history of police violence and state-sanctioned murder against African-American people is a larger issue than one bad police or one good police. It's really a systemic evil that has corrupted the very heart of criminal justice in this country. Finally, Cheryl Blankenship and I, when we heard about Billy Joe Johnson in 2007, who had been murdered in Loosedale, Mississippi, we went down to investigate. And that set us on a trajectory, a journey, where by 2014, 15, we had traveled around the country and we had documented more than 3,000 murders of African-American people by the police, unarmed African-American people by the police with some of the, with someone, with one young woman, Arianna Jones, being as young as 17 years old, seven years old, who was shot by the police as she lay sleeping in her grandmother's bed. So we have to really begin to bring to this conversation historical understanding. Otherwise, we get caught in linguistic traps about good police or bad police. I, I want to make note that some of uh, you've been given cards if you'd like to uh, ask questions. And uh, I think we're going to start collecting them because we'd like to get to that in a little bit. But I think that, first of all, uh, happy spring. Today is the first day of spring. And today is the 59th day of the Trump presidency. So uh, we want to make sure that we get to the 100 days part of our conversation. Um, uh, what do you think so far? <laughs> well, I, I think that it's really important for us to really understand why this is an unprecedented moment in American history. Yes, it is true that we've had racist presidents, white supremacist presidents. Yes, it is true that members of Congress have been white supremacists. Yes, it is true that the Supreme Court, that white supremacists have sat on the Supreme Court. But this is the first time in American history where avowed card-carrying white supremacists have captured the three branches of the government and have set about as its task to dismantle the federal apparatus. So we are in a constitutional crisis. We're in a coup d'etat era 
that was accomplished without a military, milit military violence. So we have to really pay attention to the fact that the other thing that, that Trump is not an anomaly. He didn't just come out of nowhere. He is the results of 50 or more years of Republicans stirring the pot of dog whistle politics and white supremacy in this country, the dismantling of vote, vote section four and five of voting rights, all kinds of stand your ground legislation, the militarizing of public schools where black kids attend schools that are militarized. So we are up against some very powerful forces in this country and we need to pay attention. And Trump is reiterating the course that has already been hollowed out. So I some think, of the things that we've well, seen so okay, far. Well, just oh, Herb, one of the questions I think uh, is posed is um, what have we learned from the civil rights movement, I think, that we have learned, hopefully, what they learned in the Southern Africa struggle, what they call Aluda Continua, the struggle continues. And the, uh, uh, the Trump era, where we are now, in some sense, remind me of the um, Luther Fabier's election in 17, 1876, in some sense in that uh, in order to become elected, uh, he had to garner the old s slave system, the old plantation owners. And so he sold out, his, he, he agreed to pull his troops from the South, therefore leaving uh, our people to the, uh, to the hooded um, people of the, of the South. And so there was a rollback of about 25 years of terrorism, we're talking about terror, being scared of a terrorist, that's what we've been living with all our lives. We normalized living with terror. I normalized. I knew Bin Laden, yeah, Bin Laden, Bill Bohr, Bill Laden, uh, Forbes in Arkansas, Bill, Bill uh, Bin Laden, Talmadge of Georgia. These were terrorists and, and the black codes, et cetera, et cetera. So what had been gained, we thought, with the, with the conclusion of the Civil War in 1865 and the Freedman's Bureau, of which Dr. W.E.B. Boy spoke so highly, uh, I guess you might culminate that with the Supreme Court decision, which Percy versus Ferguson, in which the Supreme Court at the time validated separate but equal. So uh, these go around as a cycle and we can never sleep, never think that we have arrived we are here. No, if anything we have learned is the struggle continues. Does indeed continue. Uh, Ruby, uh, uh, we're talking about, um, I mean, we mention has been made, as it's always made, of Black Lives Matter, yes. of the young people, the next generation. I want to know what you think of the Women's March, uh, where uh, what, what happened was that they succeeded in getting five million people worldwide to do the same thing at the same time, which is a one would say a remarkable thing. Um, you were in a in a meeting with uh, Congressman John Lewis, with l leaders of Black Lives Matter, where you apologized to them in a way because they you felt that you understood that they had been abandoned. Yes. If you can talk with about that for a bit. Well, there was a great misunderstanding about the meaning of the Southern Freedom Movement, and notice I say Southern Freedom Movement and not reductionist civil rights movement. Because part of how our civil rights were taken away from us and maintained uh, our powerlessness, constitutional powerlessness, was by terrorism and dehumanization. So the struggle for civil rights, for the struggle in the South was a struggle for human dignity as well as a struggle for constitutional and human rights. And that had been that, and it was it was also a spiritual movement that rearranged. Anytime you talk about justice, no matter what sacred text you're reading, it's a spiritual call that rearranges our relationship with each other, God, and all aspects of human existence. And so, first and foremost, when Martin Luther King talked about the mountaintop. He was talking about a higher level of consciousness 
rather than a specific physical place. And the assumption was out of that higher level of consciousness, we would reach a world house or a Pentecostal Pentecost moment. But what happened is that the movement became, the interpretation of the movement became wholly materialized and secularized. And so we thought that the movement meant the acquisition of titles, money, degrees, and, and to integrate. That became the express understanding of what the movement had been about when Martin Luther King had made it very clear that we were not trying to integrate into a burning house, that the house was on fire. But nonetheless, we sent young black people into places that were not safe, into spaces where they had to fend for themselves without the necessary protections that they needed. And we felt that we were doing the right thing because we felt that this was the meaning of the struggle. But what happened is we did them a tremendous injustice because in those spaces, there were no culture carriers. There was nobody in those spaces to decode for them the meaning of the journey like my teachers did in the South when they told me I had to be twice as good as a white person in order to succeed. They were there by themselves and they became an abandoned generation. And we began to see the casualties of that abandonment in the 1970s when the black community began to wrestle with crack cocaine. And young people today, young black people today oftentimes feel a great disconnect because one of the things that the empire does is eradicate intimacy. And under the guise of desegregation, the continuity that existed that was essential to black survival, intergenerational continuity, was broken. And 85% of the teachers were white. And 38,000 black teachers were fired in 1967. And so there was a lack of intimacy. There's been a lack of intimacy between younger and older black people in the way that I understood and knew, the knowing. And young black kids feel abandoned. They feel that we threw them out to fend for themselves. And they think that we did not give them the protection and the cover that they needed. And they are very, either they are heartbroken or they are angry. And when I apologized that night, big adults in Black Lives Matter cried. And the whole atmosphere went from being anger, angry to being young, ch young folk in the face of older black people. And something was healed that night. And yet we find that those leaders, the new civil rights movement people, tend to be non-spiritual, non-democratic, uh, non, uh, uh, you know, uh, one person is in charge of everything, you know, and it's, you know, hierarchical, none of that, and, and are often criticized for seeming to be afloat and not moving forward because there isn't the one central Martin Luther King Jr. or uh, to, to, lead, to lead them. Clarence, do you have a thought about that and, and, and Herb too? Well, yeah, that's when I had met when I uh, mentioned uh, there are lessons for uh, the sort of new activists, you know, to, uh, in the civil rights movement. You know, they 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 should take time to to study uh, the social protest movement uh, because they did have a lot of successes. Uh, but on the other hand, and you know, they they do uh, note uh, some of its uh, failures and weaknesses. Um, you know, uh, looking at you know, focusing on the charismatic leader. But by, by the way, we should note that Ella Baker was always critical of the charismatic uh, leader approach, and she uh, advocated group-centered leadership, right? And and so I think you know that's one lesson that many young people sort of uh, taking away. Um, 
And yeah. yet so many of the leaders, the new leaders, are women, the Black Lives that, that, Matter that's leaders. That's correct. And I, and Another criticism of the earlier movement, right? Uh, that uh, the, the lack of formal leadership positions for, for women in that movement. Right. I get nervous when people reduce strategies to the movement, of the movement to one monolithic approach. SNCC had an approach to leadership that said, let the people decide. And it, we did not see ourselves as circulating around a charismatic leader. It was raising up leaders out of the body of the people. And so that I think that we have to really begin to nuance the different strategies that, that existed during the Southern Freedom Movement and take from each of those strategies the cultural resources that worked and throw away the ones that did not work. But I think that in each of those approaches, we can find things that really work. And finally, let me just say something about Black Lives Matter. That is not a new cry. From the very point of captivity, when black people were forcibly brought over to this country on, on ships of enslavement and reduced to property, black people's assertion was that black lives matter. So this has been a constant theme that has been a part of black struggle in this country to say that black lives matter in a society that said that black lives did not matter, in a society that said that we were property, that we were second class citizens, and that we were third class human beings, that black people's at the heart of our struggle has been this assertion. And young people today must be put within that within that long trajectory and that context to see that they're uttering the same cry that their great, 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 great grandparents uttered on sites of terror during enslavement in the South. So I don't want you, I mean, the applause could go on forever, Ruby. I don't know. I mean, where are you preaching next? <laughs> We want, we want to be there for sure. Uh, I don't want uh, you to move away from the Women's March piece because you do identify yourself as a feminist. And um, talk a little bit about that in terms of women, women activists and women in the, mo in the movement. Well, I think that's also a very long history in American society. And I think that it was very, it, what, this is what I think. I think I agree with Gloria Steinem that this part of the century that we're living in, we will see the rise of authentic women leadership who will contest patriarchy, who will t contest heterosexism. And I think it was a major feat, uh, as major as the March on Washington was when black people gathered in the Capitol, when black people were to be seen and not heard. We live in an era where women are to be seen and not heard. And that march was very democratized because it had women, it had lesbians, it had women from all different social locations. Now that doesn't mean it was perfect, but my position is, is that that was a major moment in, in American history against a backdrop of white culture warriors who are not only white supremacists, but they are also misogynist, heterosexist culture warriors. Reverend Daughtry, I want to, I was just uh, noticing that uh, Carol Anderson's book, uh, White Rage, uh, won the uh, National uh, Book Critics Circle Award last, uh, last week. And when she talks about the difference between black rage and white rage, you know, everybody blames it on all of our troubles on black rage, you know, and what she says about white rage is it is not about visible violence, but rather it works its way through the courts, the legislatures, and a r range of government. It wreaks havoc subtly, almost imperceptibly. It's not the Klan. White rage doesn't have or wear sheets or burn crosses. It works in the halls of power. So your response to that? It is, it, yeah, it, it, it is significant, I think, that no matter how much we have emphasized blackness, black nationalism, black power, black liberation army, it has never been about denying other people their rights. It has never been about violence to other people. It has simply been the quest to affirm our own worth within an African centrism. 
and to struggle for our freedom and at the same time uh, to struggle for the freedom of everybody, even in the heyday of, of black power. Uh, just as um, um, Reverend Sales has indicated, Kwame was as open to anybody. Uh, he used to always say, love the people and organize. Uh, and so we have never been against, that's, that's not our history. It is very interesting to me that even after the Civil War, even after slavery is supposed to have ended, there was no uh, record of black former slaves setting out to kill the white slave masters. There's no record of any uh, concerted effort to hunt down the most brutal slave masters, the crackers, as they were called. There's, it's not, that's not our history. No, that's not our, so never equate uh, white nationalism, whatever that is, with black nationalism. Black nationalism was, again, uh, the attempt to affirm uh, our somebodyness, our, uh, our Africanness, uh, our worth, our history. Uh, reparation came out of that movement uh, to affirm that this country, England, was built on the backs of slave labor and selling black bodies across the world. So we were never against white people at all. I'm talking about a concerted effort. There might have been some here, there, and there, but that's not what we were about. After civil rights movement, so to speak, is another kind of movement. It, it, it kind of came to a black power, which so and Kwame and I was at 66, it was screen black power down in Greenwood. And then came, you know, the African liberation. We began to look at the world and find ourselves within the context of an international struggle uh, in Southern Africa in particular, in the Caribbean. Uh, where, where we began to live out what Marcus Garvey had said a long time ago, you know, up your mighty people. Uh, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. So, I, for instance, I even went to Belfast. I participated, and I might have some of my friends, made Sinclair Bond and I made a movie while in Belfast, The Black and the Green, which we demonstrated that in the history of black people, we supported, Fred Douglas, way back a hundred and some years ago, supported the Irish struggle. So we have been about freedom for everybody. But because we've been robbed of our dignity, our name, our somebodyness, our location, there came a time that it was absolutely necessary to affirm that, yes, we are people of African ancestry, black and proud, we used to sing. Uh, the things that were rejected about us, we began to assert. And lo and behold, guess what happened? Euro ethnics began to say, yeah, yeah, your hair is... Is, is cornrow, as we used to say. Yeah, that's a beautiful, <laughs> Bo Derek say, oh, let me try to get my hair like that. You know, lo and, and behold, then. guess what happened? When we began to assert our value, our artistic genius, they said, yeah, black is beautiful, but white is beautiful too. Right. You know, they suddenly discovered right, right. that everybody was beautiful. Right. But we, again, just to emphasize the risk of taking too long. I just need to emphasize it, that uh, those of us who come out of the black power movement and the, and, and the black is beautiful and the Afrocentrism, uh, we, we, we coalesce with whoever is struggling for human rights and self-determination. But you can, you, you can trust the person more when they themselves trust themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And love themselves. Can I Thank just you. say something yes. about Go women right. and, and the world that we're living in today? I must admit that I was deeply appalled and deeply disturbed at the male patriarchal vilification of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> the false equivalencies that defeminized her, dehumanized her, that held her to a different moral standard than Donald Trump. And that bothered me not only from the right, 
but also from the progressive left. It is a deep problem that transcends class in this society because it appeared to me that at the heart of the progressive struggle was also the question, the angst, about what does it mean to be white in America today when whiteness carries different connotations and in many instances do not, does not have the same currency as it once did. And I think that I saw the rage and the anger coming not only from the right, but also from the left. And what stunned me was that the rage was directed principally at the Democratic Party and nothing, no analysis on the 50 year covert and overt war of the rabid white supremacist Republicans who want to make America be a white supremacist nation again. And I think that the war on women in this country has been as insidious in many ways as the war on people of color. And no, we are not in a post-gender world. So it was very important that women gathered to contest the malevolent power of the patriarchy and to give, to shatter the lie that America belongs to white men. But what, what I don't understand, I'm totally just confused, when we looked at the who voted for whom, and when the statistics say 53% white women voted for Trump, I don't know whether those statistics are correct or not, uh, what, 94% black women, uh, then you, you wonder, are we really together on this? I don't want to be divisive, and I don't, I'm for everybody's rights. But... I well, mean, because you, black people I'm, voted for Trump too, does that mean like there was not that the efficacy of black anti-Trump? Yeah, but I think ninety ninety four percent voted for uh, Mrs. Clinton. Fifty three percent white women. At least that's the statistics that they yeah, quoted. I think Gloria Steinem has. Uh, right. Ruby, do you want to handle that? I better let you. Well, handle. I think that Martin um, Du Bois raised the question in the double consciousness of African American people when he talked about navigating the terrain of being black and and an Amer and, and American to be African and to be American. I also think that women navigate the double consciousness, especially white women, of being women and being white. And I think the vote expressed that double consciousness. And I think that black people internalize white supremacy, and I think women internalize patriarchy. And we saw a perfect example of that internalization being exhibited in the Clinton campaign. But that does not eradicate the truth of the historical analysis of the dynamics that were at play with the vilification of Hillary Clinton in that election season. I want to get to uh, a couple of questions. We have to handle these uh, swiftly. We're running out of time, although I don't want to go. I just want to listen. Um, uh, as uh, folks who joined the movement in your youth, young, energetic, fed up, what are three cautionary tales that you have for today's young leaders? I didn't hear the question. Pardon me, Mark. You have a, a, a cautionary tale for the new civil rights leaders of our time, the movement, something that you learned from your experience that you would say, uh, I w wouldn't quite do it that way. Clarence, do you want to start or anything? Well, burnout is burnout. extremely uh, important. Um, you know, talking to um, people who were, you know, who were activists um, uh, in both uh, civil rights and, and black power movement. Uh, folks who gave uh, essentially their lives 24 seven to this. And you know, near the end of their you know, activism, they would just say that we were just ex extremely exhausted, burnt out, you know. So uh, you know, w one lesson is, is that you, know, you gotta take care of yourself. I think uh, in, in the struggle. I mean, you cannot just forego, uh, you know, uh, yourself in the, in, in the social protest movements. Yeah. yeah, I would uh, 
endorse that 100 percent. I think that's general. I think we lead in all the major diseases. And um, of course, I became vegan about 35 years ago. It saved my life. Otherwise, I'd be dead and gone. And so I'm, I'm 80, 87 now. And I've been, wow. been, I've been at, at 60 years, by the way. I've been pastoring the same church 60 years. Wow. Uh, but I like to think that God said to me, listen, you got to change your lifestyle. Or you're going to go the way of your father who died at 56. And so I became vegan. But I think that that is true throughout our lives, particularly as uh, people of African ancestry, but especially leaders in the movement. I watch my colleagues, most of them are gone, or if they are still around, they're incapacitated, right? And I'm, I'm still, I walked from, for the Me and Man March, I walked from Brooklyn to Washington at 75. I still play basketball, I'm still, <laughs> All right. I'm still I'm still fast as lightning, but uh, uh, no. so so the point we is I think that what, yeah what, as 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 uh, I think as leaders uh, they they should learn from the past their health is so important that people need them and they need to be in the service. I think, again, the respect for elders, you know, that uh, we learn from our elders, the respect for elders. I'm not sure if that's extensive um, today. And again, back to the struggle continue for have a goal, what, what, win something sometime, otherwise you're going to dissipate your energy and the people are going to become frustrated. So you, in the struggle, it seemed to me you've got to deliver something and know what it is that you're trying to deliver. Otherwise, uh, you'll just be uh, frustrated after a period of time. Ruby? I think that we have to guard against this memory. And we have to approach the struggle to understand that struggle is, is, a, is continuous. And that we must approach the dynamic struggle with hindsight, insight, and foresight. And I think it's also important for us to develop a language that is also dynamic. And the movement was one part of a struggle. We failed to, to ask the question that Dr. Martin Luther King raised in the Birmingham jail when he said, where do we go from here? We understood where we were moving from in terms of from Southern apartheid to a land of freedom, but we didn't understand what would be the sound of our names as a nation and as a people in this land of freedom. And so I think that we have to constantly interrogate our assumptions and understand that the empire never sleeps. Just as we run a touchdown, the empire is creating another block run. And so I think that what I would also say finally is that the greatest, the greatest resistance that we can have against empire is intimacy. And to understand that we are up against always a system of containment, surveillance, fragmentation, dehumanization, criminalization, and all of the way tools that empires, no matter where they are in the world, use in order to contain people and oppress them. And finally, to appreciate and understand that every per people who've contested oppression has created a counterculture. And it's the role of scholars not to be accountable to the, to the official narrative, but to help decode the meaning of the counterculture and the counter-narrative. All right. Well, Scholar, we're going to leave that to you uh, and your students who are busy working on the, the next generations of scholarly works uh, that explain the civil rights movement. And 
All right, thank you, Clarence, very much. Ruby has put it, given you the challenge. Ruby Sales, thank you so much for being here uh, tonight. Your spirit, uh, I'm uh, glad you brought the ruckus with you. <laughs> and, and Reverend Daughtry, I'm going to do some shadow boxing with you out, you know, and the thing afterwards. Well, then. Stay in shape. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. Our, our speakers will meet you outside in the lobby. If you, anybody wants to ask a personal question or say anything or, you know, get Ruby's phone number for daily advice. Uh, but thank you all so much for being here.